Welcome to the Exam Study Expert Podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth. Hello, and let me ask you a question to start with. What kind of opinion would you form about a recently graduated academic that described themselves as following? I'm an involuntary swindler whose work doesn't deserve the attention it receives. Would you want such an individual as your professor or a tutor at college? Now, what if I told you that that quote didn't belong to a recent graduate at all, but it was none other than Albert Einstein? True story. That's imposter syndrome for you. If even Albert Einstein can describe himself as an involuntary swindler, what hope do the rest of us have? (laughs) Imposter syndrome is that unwarranted sense of insecurity that leaves many of us feeling as though we haven't earned or are somehow not worthy of our success. It's a feeling that can be rife in various parts of academic life, perhaps especially in selective or prestigious positions such as elite universities or sought-after grad programmes and doctorates. When I arrived at Cambridge University as a freshman student, I saw imposter syndrome all around me. We were even told explicitly by our tutors that they had not made a mistake. We were all absolutely supposed to be there. This wasn't an admissions error. Uh, It just goes to show how common that sort of sensation is among inbound students at universities. Apparently, as many as 70% of us can have these sorts of feelings at some point in our life. Uh, and minority groups and women being particularly likely to experience these kinds of feelings of self-doubt. As I'm neither a woman nor a minority group, I'm going to be bringing on some other voices later on in the podcast to share their experiences of insecurity and imposter syndrome in academia. Uh, And at the end of this episode, I'll summarise a few practical ideas to help you keep imposter syndrome and insecurity at bay in your life. But first, I want to welcome back Professor Mark Durand, uh, an old friend of the podcast, who is a quite brilliant ethnographic researcher and a really inspiring lecturer in the business school at Cambridge. He gave us some excellent advice on applying for business school, both at undergraduate and MBA level, back in episode 34. But I've also had some very candid and open conversations with him about his own experiences with doubt and insecurity as a student, which I want to share with you for the first time today. I think many of us will be able to relate on some level to the feelings you're about to hear him describe about his insecurities, both as a younger student and and beyond. Let's start by hearing a little more of his story. As a student, I wasn't particularly promising. Um, I was a good student in primary school, but in, in, in secondary school, um, I, uh, I I fared very poorly. In fact, I was held back for one year because I didn't pass a single course um, that whole year. Um, and then in my final year before the exams, um, I um, I was expected to fail and be held back another year. Um, the only reason I didn't fail is because I finally decided to get my act together in about three weeks. Um, went over all the material for the for the year. Um, I locking myself in my room and um, just getting to work. And I did very, very well on my exams. Um, But it's the the only way I got through high school. I then went to another school and midway through my birthday, I dropped out because I I didn't much care for the school, nor what I was learning or meant to learn. Um, And then my parents put me to work in a metal factory, which I did for about six months and hated it. And, I think only then realized that it was time for me to, to get my acting gear and move to the UK. Partly because it was the only place I could start over again from scratch because no one knew me or knew anything about me and my history. And so I went to a really rather unpromising, completely unknown uh, college, which was a, a college of an American university that happened to be in Berkshire. I ended up doing so well in my first term that people suddenly thought of me as the smart kid, which was a new experience for me, frankly. Uh, 
cool. And um, I ended up doing quite well and getting a degree, a good degree. Um, although I'm not sure that I learned very much because I, I, I still don't think today that the academic standard was very high. Um, went to America, did a master's because I really didn't know what else to do. Um, and my uh, the woman who went to to become my wife went to America, so I simply followed suit. Uh, again, I did very well, but the standard of education, I think, was very poor. Um, it's not a very well-known university at all. And then I um, was invited to start teaching, in which I did, and I loved it. And some three years later, I decided if I want to take this seriously, I need to go and pursue a PhD. And so I applied to a number of schools, um, one of which was, was Oxford. And I still don't know um, how, but I got in. In fact, I don't think I would get in today. Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm sure I, that's I, not true. I but... Well, yeah, I, I, um, I got in and had to hit the ground running. I never done research in my life. And so I um, felt quite intimidated by lots of people that seemed to be a lot more advanced and bright than I was. And, and so just worked very, very hard. Something people talk to me about quite a lot um, at various levels, but I think particularly when they start doing research for themselves or, or when they first find themselves in a, in a prestigious institution um, like, a, like a top university or, or college, they, they talk about you know, uh, this, this, this imposter syndrome. They feel like they're, they're not worthy, they're not good enough. Any, any thoughts on, on that and, and how to overcome mm. it? That's a great question, eh? Um, I've certainly felt it, still do. Um, I think many of my colleagues do. It's it's something that, um, as you know, was first identified by two colleagues at Georgia State University, and I think it was 1978, um, and studied in women and, uh, and then replicated across men, the idea being that um, people in often quite high-powered positions um, feel quite often deeply insecure about their own capabilities and might often describe their successes just have been lucky to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure there is a good strategy that I know of for overcoming it. I'm not sure that's something we want to overcome. I think part of us continues to feed the monster quite deliberately because we realize that the reason we probably do as well as we do is because we are driven by that insecurity. Um, so I think we live in this perverse relationship, you know, whereby we we hate what it is we live with, but we keep feeding it nonetheless because we know that without it, we might not actually succeed in the same way we have or are, even though we might actually be a lot more content. Um, it's all very strange, but, um, you know, yeah, I mean, gosh, I feel it all the time, you know. Um, I don't know. I think I think what helps me is to to have come to a place or be coming to a place gradually whereby I'm I have a reasonably good sense of what I want to do and what I think I can do, realizing full well that it's not going to change the world, I'm not going to be particularly profound, um, but hopefully it will make a difference to some people, um, and and that is okay. Um, and as long as I keep reminding myself of exactly what it is that I think I can do, the skills that I have. And as long as I'm okay in accepting that the impact may be relatively small, um, so reaching a few people rather than very, very many people, that I think is all right. I mean, you know, we, we I think we all hope to leave something behind, you know, for whatever reason. Um, sure. To realize that, that you can actually, and we all can make a positive difference in ways that are very true to who we are. I think that, that probably took me a long time to figure out what is it to, to be me, you know, which is probably quite different from the many potential me's that we've pursued throughout our lives, which would have been reflections of, of other people we've admired or respected or we think we should be more like. And I think maybe that just comes with age. You know, mm. you know as we get older, we probably, I'm not sure that we care less, but I think we become more comfortable in, in who we are. Some really interesting perspectives there, I thought, uh, being comfortable with who we are. Uh, and for Mark, almost this idea of seeing a little insecurity as perhaps being almost a force for good, uh, driving him to achieve more. 
from my experience, my own experience working with students, I definitely say there's a balance to strike, though. Uh, a highly complacent student may certainly benefit from a little more of this kind of drive uh, and a bit more, uh, perhaps almost discomfort, uh, to, to, to make sure they're continually striving for their best. Um, but absolutely too much insecurity can certainly be unhealthy uh, and become detrimental, in, in my view. So, as promised, let's also hear from a few additional voices to talk about their experiences of imposter syndrome and to discuss their coping strategies. What you're about to hear is a rebroadcast extract taken from a little segment of episode 17, which was all about what it's like to do a PhD. In that episode, I brought on a range of PhD candidates who were studying at Oxford and Cambridge universities and asked them about their experiences and their tips for anyone aspiring to do a PhD or doctorate. In the extract we're about to hear just now, I invited my guests to talk about their experiences with feeling like they're not good enough or they're not sure whether they've got what it takes. Uh, And I asked them to share any advice they had for what works for them for overcoming uh, and dealing with such feelings. You're going to hear in turn from Alad Walker, Kalina Naidu, Christina Courageous, and Andrea Di Antonio. Here's Alad to kick things off. Doing research is so bound up with one's personal sense of self-worth and self-esteem because it is so personal, uh, more than almost any other job I could think of apart from perhaps a professional musician. But when the research is not going so well, and there will be times when it's not going so well, it can have an emotional impact. Just I, I speak from some experience that it can be very helpful to have emotional stability in the rest of your life while you're doing a PhD, because the PhD provides enough challenges by itself. A lot of students suffer from imposter syndrome, that sense of feeling you're not really good enough to be doing what you're doing. Here's Kalina with some thoughts on how you can cope. Coping with imposter syndrome is a tricky one. It's so ubiquitous at a tertiary level. What's helped me is surrounding myself with grad friends that are going through similar things and don't just talk about the highs of the default, but the lows as well. Even if you can't get that, joining social media groups like something like a meme sharing page full of scientists who make memes about everyday struggles of science really reminds you that all these setbacks don't make you a failure, that it happens to everyone. What also helps is joining societies that involves interacting with people from different academic backgrounds, where your research interests are so different, you can't compare it. And very often you're reminded that the work you're doing is quite interesting. And being able to explain that work to someone who isn't in your field is an achievement in itself. And it's really good for reminding you that you are knowledgeable about something and you do deserve to be here. Other people can do wonders to remind us of our worth and value. Christina recommends recording your successes as another way to get that kind of reminder. It is normal to feel you don't deserve being where you are sometimes. Just don't let that feeling overshadow your work and motivation. When that feeling comes up, I try to rationalise things. Recalling what I have achieved so far, the feedback I get from my supervisor and the people working with me. Also, next time you have achieved something, big or small, write it down. Every time you feel as an imposter, read those notes again. It will help you realising that you truly belong where you are. Andrea looks to those who've been there and done it already for inspiration when the going gets tough. Long periods with with limited results. Is, is what I struggle the most with, with my studies. It can be hard to cope and, and really frustrating. I, I find it beneficial to discuss how I feel with senior members of the group that have been through the PhD and are now postdocs. Sometimes like hearing that they've been through the same phase and, and, and they managed to, to go through it because eventually they got some results is really helpful. My thanks there to Aled, Kalina, Christina and Andrea. And again, if you want to hear more from them and about their PhD experiences more generally, then head back to episode 17, How to Survive a PhD. Of course, as Mark told us, it's not just PhD candidates that get imposter syndrome. It's something that can bite for any of us, no matter what stage we're at in our studies. 
So in this final section of the podcast, I want to build on some of the ideas we've been hearing from all of my guests so far and summarise for you my five suggestions for overcoming imposter syndrome and self-doubt when it rears its head in your life. Firstly, accentuate the positive. As Christina said a little earlier, you could keep a praise file, a record of all the nice things people have said about you. You could even incorporate some major achievements. So note down any marks that you're especially proud of if you're a younger student, or if you're an older student sort of at the research level, write down any conferences you've spoken at that you're particularly pleased with, or maybe even any times you've been featured in the news or media for any reason. Look back on your praise file any time you're doubting your self-worth. Secondly, develop a healthy response to failure and making mistakes. Realise that not every setback is evidence of your incompetence. Sometimes the fault will be due to things in your environment and nothing to do with you at all, such as dodgy lab equipment, an unhelpful supervisor or teacher, or perhaps not having studied a particular precursor to your current course, which puts you on the back foot compared to your classmates. Other times, of course, the responsibility may sit with you. But as we talked about with renowned mindset scholar Professor Tim Wilson uh, a couple of episodes ago, you do have a choice on how you interpret a failure. Do you see it as evidence that you're incompetent? Or preferably, do you see it as a wake-up call that you might need to change or adjust something about how you approach things to get better results and keep advancing and progressing and improving in future? Building on my last point, thirdly, practice positive self-talk. Remember that nobody belongs here more than you, no matter what you might think. And if you're holding yourself back because you're doubting yourself, you're robbing the world of something that might be able to help other people. One specific idea here, for example, instead of looking around the room and thinking, oh my gosh, everyone else in this environment is brilliant and I'm not, perhaps consider going with, wow, everyone else here is brilliant and I'm really going to learn a lot from them. It's a subtle difference, but a really powerful shift in mindset that sets you up to take advantage of your situation rather than being intimidated by it. Fourthly, understand that to fake it till you make it is a skill in and of itself, as many high performers understand well. Courage comes from taking action and taking risks. Sometimes you need to be bold and just go ahead and change your behaviour first and start taking action, even if it feels uncomfortable at first. And then you can allow your confidence to build and to catch up. The longer you fake it, the more that confidence will grow. Finally, talk about it. Do what you can to encourage open conversations with your peers and your tutors about what you're feeling. You may just find that quite a few other people are feeling just as much of a fraud as you are. Perhaps a nice way to start those conversations could be by sharing this episode with your peers on your social media channel of choice or sending the link around some friends via email or WhatsApp. And just before I wrap this episode up, you're always welcome to talk to me too. I, as well as practical advice on productivity, time management and efficient study strategies, I often spend quite a bit of time with my one-on-one -on -one study coaching clients about their mindset. And I'm very happy to help you think through and overcome any unhealthy thought habits that you might be succumbing to when it comes to your academic progress as a student at school, university or graduate level. To find out more about doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, head to examstudyexpert.com forward slash coaching, where you can schedule an introductory chat with me today. That's examstudyexpert.com forward slash coaching. And that concludes this week's episode. Thanks for listening today and wishing you a safe and productive week in your studies.